I'm Danny, that witch next door, and you're listening to That Witch Podcast. Well, hello, neighbor. Welcome to another episode here at That Witch Podcast. I'm Danny. I'm that witch next door, and I'm going to be your host, your guide, your mentor, and instructor in all things magic, witchcraft, astrology, and witchy business. And today we have the final planet in our How to Work with the Outer Planetary series, Pluto. Now, you may or may not already know this or have noticed, but I do have an episode previously called Working with the Planet Pluto. And I did this because I didn't want to title the episode, The U.S. Pluto Return, blah, blah. I I didn't want that to be the whole entire basis of the episode. And I, I did a, a overall well-rounded description on my understanding of and my experience with Plutonian energy and um, kind of put all of that through the scope of this U.S. Pluto return that was official and exact this year in February. But I still wanted to do an official Pluto episode here in the Outer Planetary series. Number one, to still go over the orbit retrograde cycles, uh, the colors, et cetera. Um, But to just put this planet through the same format and structure we put all the rest of the planets now um, so that hopefully it helps create or bring up any new connections for you. And hopefully you learn a little something new about Pluto today. So first of all, as a reminder, last last reminder, that these outer planets are very, very different than the inner planets. These are generational. And so many people are born over the course of this planet being in any one given sign. And that's why they're generational. They're generationally shared among many, many different people throughout your community and world, okay? Now, Pluto particularly has a very different orbit pattern than the rest of the planets that we've gone over. So it takes Pluto about 248 years, and you always hear me round that to 250, but it's technically about 248 years, uh, to make one full revolution around the sun, okay? Now, on an astronomical level, Pluto is categorized as a dwarf planet, And so is Ceres, the asteroid, actually. Well, it was originally classified as an asteroid and now has been classified as a dwarf planet, which is also what Pluto is classified as. And I believe Eros is as well. But I digress. These are different episodes for a different day. Now, Pluto still in astrology and astrological terms we talk about as a planetary energy the way we do with the rest of our planetary energies, right? Whether it's Chiron, the asteroid we're talking about, Pluto, the dwarf planet, um, Saturn, the planet, the moon, the celestial body, right? The sun, which is a celestial star. Uh, Even though these are all astronomically different, they are each celestial energies that we see reflected within ourselves as and at, and outside of ourselves in our environment and in our relationships, right? Um, through archetypal work. That's what all of this is. And so, yes, Pluto is technically considered a dwarf planet, but for shorthand reference, when we're speaking astrologically, I'm going to just refer to Pluto as a planet over and over again, okay? So, takes Pluto about 248 years to get around the sun. Jesus. So it took Neptune 165 years. And so now, and Neptune, by the way, spent, spends about 14 years in each sign, just to remind you, it doubled Uranus. Uranus spends about seven years in each sign. Pluto, on the other hand, I have some, I bookmarked some very interesting Plutonian transit historical type uh, 
resources for everybody that are in the show notes for you. If you're just curious to kind of fall down this rabbit hole, it was really fun. I let myself for a little while. Um, Pluto <clears throat> is in any one given sign from anywhere from 12 to 30 years, up to 30 years. What a huge difference. That's, that's what, 18 years? That's a huge difference. So as soon as I, you know, and I know that Pluto has this range, and I always know that in my head as an astrologer, but I always categorize that in my brain as like, yeah, up to 30 years in a sign. And I never really give full time reference and context to that range of how long it can be in one sign compared to another. And so when I was doing a little bit of research for the show, and you really see that number in front of you, this 18 year difference. It's in its home sign of Scorpio for the least amount of time for 12 years about. And it's in its fall or detriment sign of Taurus, which is opposite Scorpio, for the longest, which is about 30 years. In fact, I read a fun little quip that said, um, some modern astrologers think that Pluto's home sign should actually be considered Taurus because of that. How fascinating is that? How much does that just stir up everything that we know about, you know what I mean? That this huge section of astrology, um, which I, I just had to throw that out there for you. If you find that interesting, again, go fall down that fun rabbit hole, Alice. Uh, it's a great one. Anyways, I'm look, I, I see this number right in front of me while I'm researching and I'm like, what? I need to like, see this. I'm very visual in that way. I'm like, I need to see this. What do you mean? 12 to fucking 30 years when you say that and I'm just reading it. So I just go start reading a bunch of Pluto transits, which essentially is a lot. Again, it's linked if you want to go do the same thing. It's essentially a list of dates from this date in this year to this time Pluto was in this sign and then it went retrograde and it went back into this sign from this date to this date. And then it went back into this sign from this date. That's all it is. Just a long list like that. But it provided a lot of really, really powerful context. And Pluto, I firmly believe a huge role of Pluto is for just that, what I'm describing, context of time, concept of time. So much of Plutonian energy, and you'll hear this if you go back and listen to that first episode I did about Pluto, um, which is also linked for you. Um, there's so much patience that goes into Plutonian work. So much of everything you come back to and you're learning about Pluto, Plutonian traits, different ways to apply these, these teachings and the, this, um, you know, these findings of, of Plutonian transits really is about having overall patience because these different events are things that are totally beyond the understanding and comprehension of the people experiencing them at the time. And these, these events are not actualized and, I mean, really conceptualized for many centuries. So it's a really humbling act to research Plutonian transits, especially on this, this historical sense. Uh, and I've recommended that for all of these outer planet episodes, a wonderful way to apply your knowledge when you've kind of gone and done some digging on Uranus, on Neptune, on Pluto, and you combine that with your knowledge and understanding of the energy of the zodiac signs, you can then go look up historical Pluto transits, major historical Neptune transits. I promise you, you'll find some gold. And at the very least, you can find, you can, and fall into a pretty fun click hole from there into your astrological historical research. Um, but you'll find that these different events, you know, there's, there's in a lot of ways, they were things that were a long, long, long time coming. I mean, really, 
when you look at it all on paper, you're like, yeah, I mean, I see why these people got to the point that they got to. I see why this this came to a fall. I see why this came to an end, right? Because that's Pluto stuff, baby. Um, but because we know that humans almost default to the immediate, the here and now, the day-to-day, the short term. I mean, our life cycles are relatively short considering, you know, living beings on the earth, living things in our universe in general. Like, And so it makes sense that our concept of time is much smaller scale and that Plutonian concepts and lessons go beyond that comprehension. And they're those things that we learn from our ancestors, like capital A, man, like That's Plutonian work to me is ancestral work. Uh, That's why so many death witches and death practitioners and those that work with deities and beings of the underworld uh, work with Plutonian energy and Pluto transits and Pluto in their chart, et cetera, et cetera, because there is this trust in the what seems like finality and permanence of death and destruction, right? That's Pluto. But then months go by, years go by, decades go by, centuries go by, and so forth. And we're able to look back and go, oh, yeah, I see why, you know, there's no way they could have understood that then. You know, we have so much more point of reference now. We have so much more gathered data now. We have so much more context. And so I can see why this was really above those people at that time. I need you to understand we are those people right now. We always will be. There, that's what Pluto shows us, that there is always something way, way, way bigger at play that's way beyond any one single human life incarnation. So this is why these outer planets are so fascinating and so different to work with because these concepts are so much more large than the the concepts that we usually work with on the inner planets, which is a lot of inner and personal and self-work. Yes, in these outer planets, self is still very much involved. We individually have these natal placements for a reason, but these outer planets teach us, just like my my Bugs Life uh, reference in a couple episodes ago, that outer planets and generational placements teach us that we are an individual as part of a many collective, okay? That's really one of the biggest, biggest symbols of all three of these planets is that, yes, we are self. That's why self, inner, personal planets and work matters. And it matters so fucking much because you are part of a whole. Not but, because. That's why self matters, because you are a fractal of source. You know, like we say that and it just, it's its another, it's an outer planet concept. So it goes above our head a lot. But when we really sit with it, that's what Pluto gets us to do. There's that patience. It gets us to sit with big concepts and not rush them and not force ourselves to understand it in any one singular given moment. It, it gives us the patience and permission to be patient with ourselves, to let concepts unfold under t- over time, to be under an observation mode, to be a long-standing learner and observer and active participant, okay, in your experience. Not but you're part of a collective because you're part of a collective. You are a fractal of the divine. You, that means that you're part of what makes divine divine. You bring divinity. 
Hey everyone, just a really quick pause in today's show to show some appreciation for today's episode sponsor. One of my favorite companies that I've started working with and partnering with has been Goddess Provisions Subscription Box. Um, It has been one of the best ways to re-spark and just re-inspire my connection to magic and my witchcraft every single month delivered right to my door. This month's July Luminous Light Box did not disappoint and I did not know how they were going to top last month's solar box because I'm a sun-ruled Leo rising baby. Um, But this this bright and brilliant um, and really colorful box this month was such a treat to receive um, during what's been a really heavy and kind of dark time for everybody. And I I particularly love the Snowy Owl Kombucha Ultraviolet Tea. I've been wanting to try one of these color-changing teas for so, so, so long. And so I could not wait. Um, I was so ecstatic when I pulled that out of the box this month. But that was just one among so many amazing magical goodies this month. The box is always um, valued retail way higher than what you actually pay for your um, subscription. This month I added it up and it was well over $100 retail. Um, And the box is only $33 a month. It ships for free in the US. And actually, they'll give you a pretty sweet little discount if you prepay for some boxes and kind of buy them as a a bundle ahead of time. So this has quickly become one of my most favorite treats ever. Um, And so if you're interested and want to have this magic for yourself in your life, and you also want to support the show, please head to the show notes and you can purchase yours through my affiliate link. Thank you so, so much. And now back to the show. So even though Plutonian stuff is darkly themed and and veiled, right? There's this dark veil over Plutonian energy and work and themes because of this death and destruction. But remember that to keep going from that, because that's the point of Pluto is also the ripple effects here, which is the rebirth and the rebuild. Without the death, without the destruction, we do not get the rebirth and the rebuild. They are cohesive. They are exclusive to each other, essentially, right? They feed and fuel one another. So it makes tons and tons of sense that Pluto is associated with colors black, brown, crimson, and maroon. Not just red, right? Crimson and maroon, like, Ugh, earthly red. <laughs> when I think of crimson and maroon, that's what I think of as like red of the earth. And uh, shocker, Pluto rules Scorpio. Um, so this is where Scorpio gets a lot of its darker energy and things that it enjoys and its aesthetic and environment and things it's interested in. And Pluto is associated with the water element. Okay. And so water can be both cleansing and destructive. So think about erosion via rivers or rain over time or waterfalls. You know what I mean? This is fixed water, right? Scorpio's fixed. This is fixed water energy. So water does have the ability to purify and cleanse and to erode away and dissolve and destruct, right? And so there is a lot of facets to Plutonian energy in general. Um, and, and really there's many, many facets to all of these outer planets. And just remember that these traits are experienced and felt on these generational levels and spans of time. Okay. In Pluto, I want you to remember to trust in in the death and the destruction because you believe in and are driven to the rebirth and the rebuild. There's been this mantra that I've been saying to myself that I came up with really recently that just, it's been fitting really well and really helpful to me. And it's really, really fitting with everything we've been talking about in these planetary episodes and especially today. So take what you will with this adjust it if you need it, leave the rest. But what I've been saying is I trust the universe. Therefore, I trust myself. 
therefore I trust the universe, therefore I trust myself, and so on and so forth. And I'll let myself kind of repeat it in an almost meditative or trance-like state um, until, you know, it helps me, you know, cope or, or move through a really heavy feeling or emotion, which is really kind of how that came to me. It's a mantra to help trust and surrender to that which I can and cannot control in my internal and external environment. Um, and to remind me that because of my strong connection to spirit and the universe, um, that inherently, you know, based on my beliefs, means that I also believe in myself and vice versa. And right. I, I love that. It's this cyclical mantra that really paints the paints the overall picture of all of these celestial bodies, right? Which is time is not linear. Our existence, our, our, our universe is not linear. It's not up or down or left or right. Things are multidimensional cycles. If there's anything our solar system and astrology and astronomy teaches us, whew, it cycles in so much of earth, right? God, I could go into so many different parts of nature that teaches us the archetype of, of cycles and how it is a, basically a universal law of nature here. So I hope that, I hope that these outer planet episodes were really exciting for you, inspiring for you. Um, honestly, if they made you you know, ask some questions, uh, made you get even more curious. If, if maybe it made you ask more questions that it answered, then the outer planets are probably doing their job. And I'm probably doing my job because again, there's so much of all this that is supposed to be above our head. We're supposed to get curious. We're supposed to get intrigued. We're supposed to explore and learn all of this. And I'm so proud of all of us that we're coming out of this time period of human existence that has really put a huge detriment on true, you know, learning and exploration of experience and knowledge. And, and I just can't wait to see us all keep running, running with it. So if you feel more curious and have even more questions on all these planets and traits and events that are associated with them, good. I encourage you to keep going with this research, keep going on your quest. Please let me know if you have any questions or anything come up for you that I can help you with. I am so, so, so appreciative of you today and every day. Thank you for being a part of our magical neighborhood here. Stay safe. Have an absolutely beautiful weekend out there and stay magical. Hey, magical human. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of That Witch Podcast. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is to share with a friend or give a shout out on your social media. You can also leave a five-star rating and review on both Apple and Spotify. And if you can't get enough of all of our witchy, magical content here in the neighborhood, you definitely want to make sure you're subscribed to my email newsletter, That Witch Gazette. It's a really fun, really convenient, one-stop shop to stay up to date on all of the news and happenings here in our neighborhood. If you have any questions, suggestions, ideas for the show, or if you'd like to sponsor an episode, you can send me a message at thatwitchnextdoor.com slash conjurethatwitch. Thank you so much. I'll see y'all next time.